Welcome Vintage Hollywood Archive. Tony Curtis may be best known for dressing up like a woman in Some Like It Hot, but his long career also had turns in westerns, film noir, and epics like Spartacus. It was his off-screen life, however, where he really turned up the heat with six wives, six kids, and a boatload of affairs. How was Tony Curtis haunted by Marilyn Monroe decades later? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you're new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Vintage Hollywood Archive channel. Tony Curtis, Hollywood's Dark Heartthrob Tony Curtis and Marilyn Monroe and a Sacred Love Child Hollywood heartthrob Tony Curtis was married six times and had six children. He also may have had a secret child from one of his highly publicized flings. You can say his most high-profile marriage was his first one, to actress Janet Lee. It resulted in two children, daughters Kelly and Jamie Lee, who followed their famous parents' paths and became actresses. Besides his affair, the star was married several times in his life. Curtis claimed that he'd slept with a thousand women, including actress Natalie Wood. I was insecure about women, so I wanted to go to bed with them all. Curtis's childhood was so horrific that it seems like the poor boy was cursed. Tony Curtis was not born Tony Curtis either, but Bernard Schwartz, a name that hinted at his working-class Jewish New York origins. His father had a tailor shop in the Bronx. His mother, eventually diagnosed as schizophrenic, was erratic and often violent, and he said his relentless pursuit of women was a quest for a surrogate mother. There was no woman I could rely on except the girls I fell in love with, he said. They gave me more security than my mother ever did, that consideration and understanding that I never got from her. At one point, Curtis's parents had to send their sons to an orphanage for a month because they had no food to feed their own child. It's not a surprise that Curtis was a bit of a tough guy on the streets of the Bronx. He dabbled in gang life, but always made sure to protect his face during street fights. Curtis must have been clairvoyant because it was his handsome face that eventually got him discovered and helped him trade the Bronx for Hollywood. His piercing blue eyes and good looks gained him a great deal of attention at a young age. Curtis was taking acting classes and driving a truck to make ends meet when a talent agent spotted him and saw a star potential. And in a lucky twist, it just so happened that this talent agent was also the niece of Gone with the Wind producer and Hollywood heavyweight David O. Selznick. Soon enough, Curtis was on his way to becoming a star. Still new to Hollywood, he later freely admitted he was more motivated by the pursuit of girls and money at this stage than anything else. Unsurprisingly, he was not yet taken seriously as an actor, partly because of his New York accent and had been mocked, slightly inaccurately, for his delivery of the line, Yonder lies the castle of my father, in an early role. Bernard Schwartz moved to Hollywood and immediately changed his name to Anthony Curtis. Selznick got him under contract at Universal, and they gave him small parts in films and fencing and riding lessons. Curtis didn't have much hope that he'd make it big. He was also insecure about being a poor Jewish boy, and that Hollywood never gave me an Oscar. He admitted, at the time, that all he wanted to do was paint. Curtis's boyish good looks helped him to land a series of small movie roles, including Criss Cross, Francis, and No Room for the Groom. In 1950, Tony began romancing psycho actress Janet Lee, whom he married the following year. The two quickly became Hollywood's it couple, appearing together in movies like Houdini. Although only in her early 20s, Lee had already been married briefly twice. 
When Lee met Curtis at a publicity party in 1950, there was no denying her name carried far more weight in Hollywood. Just 23 years old at the time, Lee had already starred in several big-budget productions after fellow actress Norma Shearer discovered her in 1946. Janet was the bigger star when she met Tony. She had already starred in such pictures as Little Woman and That Forsyth Woman. Tony was being marketed as a young heartthrob by his studio. Although he already had teenage girls screaming at the sight of him, he still had not caught his big break. But none of this mattered when the pair met at an RKO publicity party and Tony was blown away by Lee's sweetness, not her star power. For a decade, they were Hollywood's golden couple. Unfortunately, it was not meant to last. Although they seemed the perfect pair, Tony was perpetually unfaithful to his wife. One of his many affairs was with former flame Marilyn Monroe. He and Marilyn Monroe had had a tender, beautiful affair, one of the great romances of his life, back when he was a young up-and-comer and she was just starting out. Curtis claimed that he had another affair with Monroe, this time during the Some Like It Hot shoot. But no, it's even better than that. If you're a Monroe fan, you may recall that she was pregnant during the making of that film. Guess whose child she might have been carrying. Tony Curtis first met a beautiful starlet in the autumn of 1948. I'll never forget the moment I first saw her. She was very voluptuous. She had red hair then, tied in a ponytail. Not much makeup. She took my breath away, he recalled. Marilyn Monroe was, like Tony Curtis, new to Hollywood and wanting to be a star, so he offered her a lift in his cheap Buick convertible and drove her to the hotel where she was staying. She gave him her number, but it was a week before he had the courage to ask her out. They then began what he said was his first true love affair. I never felt like that about a girl before, Curtis said. I really liked her, and she liked me. After their first few dates, the couple spent the night together at a friend's beach house, and Curtis realized he was falling in love with Monroe. What he hadn't bargained for was that she would so quickly float the idea of them getting married. It confused me, this whole idea of being married to anyone, let alone Marilyn. Maybe that was because I'd never seen my parents happy together. So I said, you know, one day we might get married. And she said, you promise? And I said without thinking it through in any way, of course. We were almost teenagers in love. He, in fact, was 23 in Monroe 22, and you don't ever get over your first love. His throwaway remark was to come back to haunt him a decade later when the couple met again on the scene of Some Like It Hot, both having found fame and marriage to other people in the intervening years. Curtis was married to Janet Lee, with whom he had one daughter and another. Monroe was married to husband number three, playwright Arthur Miller. He couldn't stand her during filming together at the first time, and if you'd ever made a movie with Marilyn Monroe, you'd have hated her too. Her colleagues would be on the set at nine, and she'd stroll in at noon, then stay in her trailer until two in the afternoon. She was so unstable and self-centered that she went off in a huff when she found out that she wasn't going to be in the film's final shot. They had to use a stand-in for her last day of shooting. At the time, Curtis told reporters that kissing Marilyn was like kissing Hitler, but he was just being sarcastic. I loved the idea of working with Marilyn in a movie, Curtis said. My marriage was in a bad state, and I had no idea what hers was like, but I had this insane idea that maybe something would happen between us while we were making the movie. The two began a passionate relationship, which was ultimately derailed by their showbiz ambitions. I loved her, and she loved me, but we both wanted to be in the movies, and that meant everything. When filming began in August 1958, it became apparent the chemistry was fresh as ever. In September, the unit moved to Southern California to shoot beach scenes. Miller wasn't on location, and Monroe was feeling so relaxed that at one point she whispered to Curtis, come and see me tonight. In her hotel room, one thing led to another. Curtis' account of their supposed sexual encounters 
with his memories of shooting the famous yacht scene in Some Like It Hot. Monroe tried to seduce Curtis, who was pretending to be impotent. Interesting. To be driven to such extremes by just coming into contact with a woman he's already slept with multiple times, including just a few nights before. It's not impossible, of course. When I was in bed with Marilyn, I was never sure, before, during, or after, where her mind was. She was an actress. She could play a part. She could give the part what she thought a man wanted. I never asked for more. When I walked on the set and I saw her, I swear to you I was in love with her all over again, and her with me, he recalled. She hadn't forgotten his promise. She kept reminding me that I had said I'd marry her when we were both successful, whenever she smiled at me and said, let's get divorced and then get married. A little thought went through my head of, yeah, that might be nice. Then I would remember how miserable marriage had made me and put it out of my mind. But whenever she said it, I always told her, let's wait and see. And she took that to mean we probably would. He later wondered why he never told her it was never going to happen. Maybe it's because in some small way, I loved the idea that it could happen. He added, I honestly think I was the kind of guy Marilyn needed at that time. She'd squeeze my hand and say, remember your promise? She married men who would be her father. But as a lover, what was Miller to her? She told me she loved me and more than anything wanted to have babies with me. That made me feel awkward. My wife was expecting our second child. It wasn't a marriage I wanted to stay in, but I didn't want to get divorced at that time because I thought that was the wrong thing to do. But Marilyn wanted to divorce Arthur Miller if I divorced Janet. Once again, he failed to say no. Events took an unsettling turn when Miller appeared. Curtis suspected Monroe had told her husband about their night together. Then he noticed she looked a little heavier than normal. Shortly afterwards, a newspaper claimed she was pregnant. During the first week of November 1958, Curtis and Monroe filmed their last scene. She had behaved well all day, and at the end of the day, we were on our way to our trailers and she said, Tony, I'm having our baby, and now you have to marry me. She was desperate because she wasn't happy. She figured I could make her happy. Curtis said the child was conceived while both he and Monroe were married to other people but she had a miscarriage shortly after her husband found out. Recalling the moment when he and Monroe confessed the affair to Miller, Curtis wrote, I was stunned. I just stood there. The room was so silent that I could hear tires screeching on Santa Monica Boulevard. Monroe was so unsettled by the publicity that she was barely able to work. It took 83 takes for one simple shot of her saying through the door, It's me, sugar. Soon her lines were written on cards and placed all over the set. When Miller confirmed publicly that Marilyn was pregnant, her whole demeanor changed, and so did the atmosphere on set. During yet another endless series of takes by Monroe on one scene, Curtis lost his temper and shoved a glass of ginger ale at her. Miller flew out of his chair at Curtis, who pushed him to the floor and then warded off a furious Monroe. Later that day, Curtis went to see Miller and Monroe in their trailer. Do you want to accept my apology? He asked. Only if you'll apologize for sleeping with my wife, Miller replied. He also threatened to beat the hell out of Curtis, but Monroe cried, Stop it! That won't fix it! A bemused Curtis asked what there was to fix. Monroe replied, I think the baby is yours. It couldn't have been Miller's because he wasn't up to the job anymore. Marilyn made mention that he wasn't able to make love to her anymore. Their affair ended when the film wrapped. Curtis insisted he did consider what role he should play in the child's life, but then it was reported in December 1958 that she had had a miscarriage. It colored his attitude towards Monroe for the rest of his life. After that, he rarely spoke about her, and when he did, it was usually with thinly veiled contempt. He suspected the baby had been aborted on Miller's orders. Despite the fact that his daughter Jamie Lee had been born just three weeks previously, the episode threw Curtis into a depression that contributed to the breakup of his marriage to Lee. In 1962, after 11 years of marriage and two daughters, Tony divorced Janet to marry 17-year-old Christine Kaufman, his co-star in Terrace Balma. Tony's second union, which only lasted about four years, also produced two daughters. His failed marriage to actress Janet Lee damaged his career in ways that could never be fully repaired. The marriage to Christine was barely over before Tony wed again in 1968 to model Leslie Allen, who gave him two sons, one of whom, Nicholas, sadly, 
died of a drug overdose in 1994. Although this third marriage was his longest, it wasn't the charm and ended after 14 years. Tony married three more times to B-movie actress Andrea Savio, lawyer Lisa Deutsch, and horse trainer Jill Vandenberg, his wife from 1998 until his death. Like many of his loves, last wife Jill was considerably younger, 42 years to be exact, than Tony. But what could we expect from the man who once quipped, I wouldn't be seen dead with a woman old enough to be my wife? He also leaves behind quite a sexual legacy. Tony was equally famous off-screen for chasing skirts. All through my life I wanted to conquer every woman I met, and I've been very lucky. I was falling in love every day. I'm completely in love with women. Every woman. They say I've had a thousand women. I don't know about that, but I do know what was so important wasn't just the physical aspect, it was the intimacy. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you're new here.